we have uh, a topic that um, it's something that I've always wanted to know more about. And so in a lot of ways, this is just input rather than a planned presentation on my part. Uh, but it might be kind of illuminating. Um, I want to talk about how role-playing came to each of our respective regions when we encountered it. Uh, well, those may be the same thing, they may be different depending on ages. Um, so, as an example, uh, for me, uh, I encountered role-playing exactly as everybody outside of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and similar areas, discovered it in the United States. So this was sometime around 1976, when people in my age group, uh, we used to call it mid, uh, junior high, but now they call it middle school, um, started talking about it. And I guess it's not too surprising. Uh, church groups apparently were one of the uh, avenues by which people learned these things. And this was the Unitarian Church on the Monterey Peninsula in California um, and its kid group. Um, so, uh, and a friend of mine in that who also went to my school uh, and I uh, sort of heard about Dungeons and Dragons together or separately um, and he had a copy of something by around 1977 I would say but the question is how did this come to our area and why had people heard about it because adults had heard about it at the same time and I think somebody has probably done all the relevant journalism I don't really know it but my understanding ready to be corrected is that there was some mainstream media coverage sometime around 1975. Somebody wrote an article about, just probably just to fill space, about those crazy guys in Wisconsin, you know, who had this game. Um, and so uh, that's why Dungeons & Dragons became the entry point for people to get these kinds of games. And because just because it was released at Gen Con in 1974, that's no selling point for the rest of the world. They don't know. The rest of us didn't care. We never heard of Gen Con. So great new game at Gen Con. Who, who cared? So um, that exactly how it ended up being distributed nationally at that point, I don't know. Again, that's someone else's problem. But it was the very first wave of... Dungeons and Dragons across the country. Um, we had a big military base at that time in that area. And right then, all the military guys started playing Dungeons and Dragons. So, um, insofar as there was bleed over between their culture and the teen culture, and insofar as there was uh, you know, game stores, hobby stores, Star Trek fandom, that kind of thing. Uh, just the name Dungeons and Dragons. They called it fantasy wargaming, not role playing. So that I'm guessing that must have been the words used in the article. I guess. I mean, so the question then is what? You know, the the question is compared to me who sort of got it in its, <laughs> what's the best way to put it, honestly, you know, I mean, it was released and it was out, and now we knew about it. What's the regional comparison with everybody else? Um, Herman, you puzzle me in particular, because you're over there in the Netherlands, but you have a knowledge of early role-playing games that most Americans don't even have. So, how is it, how did role-playing come to where you were? Um, I 
think, through uh, board gaming. So uh, SPI was, was a thing, and Evelyn Hill and that kind of thing. Um, and next to where I lived, across the street, about there was a big bookstore. And one of the guys there loved board games. So he stocked them, and imported them, and bought, I think when I was 12, 13, so 77, 78, I bought um, one of the big, uh, and I was totally into science fiction already. Um, not gaming, because there wasn't any, but reading books and teen books and stuff. Um, and it was, I think it was called something of the galaxy or something like that. An outreach, I think. It has a, an impressive map of, of a bit of the spiral of the galaxy on it. And I had no idea what it was. I got my dad to translate bits of it because my English was, when I was 12, 13, wasn't usually great yet. To start it, it started getting it a couple of years to impact um, And I went, to get, get going to that store across the street. And at one point, they got things like Malie and Wizard and Advanced Dungeon Dragons, Basic Dungeon Dragons, Basic Dungeon Dragons, the blue box. The, the box was colored, but the booklet was blue? I think so, yes. Okay, that's Holmes. That's the Holmes Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. Everyone calls it Basic, but its name isn't actually Basic. Yeah. 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 And I think that was the one was the first that appeared, and uh, around the same time, a Dutch role-playing game appeared in the same store and I well as far as my allowances allowance at the time has stretched I got a bunch of the stuff what was the Dutch game called uh, Kveste uh, I, I was the one I, I talked about with the um, uh, the Earthsea uh, oh right right I, I, I should make some pictures of it because it had it was role-playing but it, it also came with a little Cards with maps and items on it. it was really tactile. You have got to scan yeah. as much of it visually as you can for us. Yeah, yeah there's some of it yeah. on online already. There's, there's have been new versions of it, but the old ones sort of like well, something a thing of the time. I think. Right, uh, right. Maybe someone who, who was into um, just fantasy and a bit of. Uh, uh, yeah, I have to go get into that one. And I think when I was 16 or so, I managed to get some people, to find some people, 16, 17, to find some people who also play. Because up to that point, I was like, I like this. I want to play more of it. To play this, but who will I play it with? What interests me is how different this is from most of the European stories that I hear. Most of the European stories that I hear, uh, starting in the mid-80s, uh, have a much more local contact with high production value mm -hmm. games, whether Swedish or German in origin, you know, a few other places, Spanish or French, but, but, uh, and then at the same time, contact with licensed versions or just American imports of Dungeons and Dragons and later Shadowrun. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, a lot of people I know have only seen the Schwarze Auge, Cult, Dungeons and Dragons, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, Volume Two, and Shadowrun. That was their that was their entry point. Were just those games, and so they had no contact with the grassroots role playing of the earlier days. Um, so they thought of role playing games. They had to be these huge hardbounds, high production mm -hmm. books. Um, and so we had I had a little bit of historical arguing to do, especially in Germany, to say that yeah. no, you know, this piece of crap little book, that's the real role playing game. Mm -hmm. You know. And they said, No, that can't possibly be it. It's supposed to look like this. Where's the gold leaf on the outside, you know? Uh -huh. So um yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, so you see, I don't know how many stores of that kind there were, let alone the Netherlands. I'm talking about Europe at, at all. Not that many, I think. Yeah, that's... I, I know I went to London at some point. 
Um, I think there was was one store in the, in, in the place where I live in Utrecht, uh, which it actually was a bookstore, but they had some some stuff uh, because they had one guy there who really loved again the right and, yeah uh, as Amsterdam usual store, and it was a small a very small store in Amsterdam. And those were the only two I knew of in the Netherlands for quite a while. Right. And when I went to London a couple of years later, there were, it was in more places. There was the Games Workshop shop. Right. Store yeah. For Games Workshop very early on when they didn't make miniatures, but they imported stuff from the States. Right. Little, little tiny little shop somewhere in Hammersmith. Mm -hmm. uh, Virgin. Virgin. Well, there were some stores is scattered through London, but also mostly as part of something else uh, very often. Hmm. Store or a store or a record store. Right, right. Yeah, that not an uncommon phenomenon, as we've pointed out. Uh, mm -hmm. In the States at that point, you either had your little corner stores, little gas station stores almost, or little hobby shops, and... Um, then you had uh, a cave. Then you would go over to a record store where you would get hash pipes and surf rock albums and you know Mexican serapes and stuff like that and uh, and role playing games. Go figure. Or comics, old comics. Yeah. Um, so okay, how about the other? How about the 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 rest of you or the rest of us? What happened? How did your country? your region get role playing games you know that's a, that's a real interesting topic that you picked here uh, i'm a, i grew up in los angeles and i'm a few years younger than than, than you guys uh, so when i was probably around 9 or 10 this was probably at 1980 81 mm -hmm. um, you know being that age uh, some kid at, at school had had one of the uh, you know first edition D&D &D books um, but kind of thinking about it, and, and I went out, I bought one, but at that time, I mean, it's hard to, at that age, I mean, how are you going to get together a group, and you're barely reading <laughs> to begin right. with, but I think that one of the, was something that's kind of maybe overlooked a little bit is what really cemented uh, getting into role-playing were, like, the fighting fantasy books, you know? I picked up every single one of those I could get my hands on. There was a, and then there yeah. Yeah, I mean those were those were huge. And another thing, yeah. uh, there wasn't any game stores, but there were comic book stores. Right. So when the Marvel superheroes came out, boom! All oh man, you know, snapped up all of those champions. Of course, snapped up all of that stuff. What I guess kind of interests me is that in the states, until I would say about the mid '80s, distribution was incredibly unsystematic. And it was still very much a matter of who happens to order things at a given store. We had a store uh, when I was a younger teen, before I moved to Chicago. Um, there was a store in Carmel, California, uh, nearby to my hometown, where uh, there, the, the guy who ran the toy store was also a local actor and was a gamer. So in this store that was full of mental puzzle games and FEMO, you know, the little clay you baked and stuff like that. Um, metal, you know, ma magnet sculpture kits and high-end chess boards and stuff like that. Um, in the back, there was a rack, and that's where all the gaming stuff was. That's where you found your issues of the Space Gamer. That's where you... That's where I bought RuneQuest and Tunnels and Trolls in that shop. And, and again, it was just because of that guy. It wasn't as though there was an industry that could just hire anybody and that distribution would just roll into no matter who owned it or who was there. It was, I mean, th these are kind of shockingly grassroots. You're right about fighting fantasy, too, because those were in the bookstores. I read the, the, uh, yeah. the Seven Serpents and so on, which I think were a little bit later. They weren't the first one. Was the first one Firetop Mountain? Am I remembering yeah, that? Yeah. Right. I think that was Steve Jackson's first right. one. Right. Yeah. And um, that was, yeah, th those were in bookstores. I remember people buying them there rather. Yes. I mean, 
So um, it was a big, big deal that the first advanced Dungeons & Dragons, starting with the Monster Manual in 1977, was in Walden Books. At the time, Walden Books was the first distributor-owned bookstore. And that means that, you know, it, it, it just reversed to the usual relationship. The, the bookstores were an outlet for the distributor. There was no negotiation. Um, and it was, and this is before Barnes & Noble and before all of these other really full-service bookstores. So as far as I know, Walden Books was the first really full every genre bookstore that you could find um, where the whole place was like this big warehouse. Um, bookstores otherwise were fairly intimate spaces. They wouldn't maintain like a full stock of all the classics or something like that. You had to go to the college bookstore to get Frankenstein or, you know, Charles Dickens or something like that. Walden Books was the first, one of the first really big chains where you walked in, whatever book you wanted, they'd have it in paperback. Um, and then Dungeons and Dragons was there. So that was considered the big break-in. That was the moment that Dungeons and Dragons was supposed to go mainstream. It was supposed to be an ordinary purchase now. It was supposed to escape the hobby. It wouldn't be a hobby thing anymore. Was, and role-playing was the craze that was sweeping the nation. Does this sound familiar, my fellow American? Yeah, you yeah. know, another thing I think that should be mentioned is, especially in the early 80s, I remember all the adult gamers at that time. Right. They were like advanced squad leader. You know, they, mm -hmm. they were playing these massive, you know, uh, war game simulators. And, <laughs> the, you know, they, they weren't into role playing. You know, it's I, I remember going into a game store and it was mostly that sort of thing. And I'm like, well, well, you know. Well, I remember going into the first place that had the, in, in our town, that had the Dungeons and Dragons headquarters banner, which was sort of the first big promotional push. <coughs> this must have been 1977 because the Holmes game was the the big the the one that was featured, and um, it often wasn't in stock. It'd be sold out all the time, and I've talked about this before that the distribution was so bad and the restock was so bad. You'd go into this store and say Dungeons and Dragons headquarters, and you'd rush in, and he would probably hand you a copy of the dragon and a case of miniatures. <laughs> and That's never, so yeah, never really quite telling you that you weren't getting Dungeons and Dragons that day, mm. and or, or some assortment. You know, that's how I ended up with Melee and Wizard. You know, I'm casting around looking for the Dungeons and Dragons, and there's like this thing that looks. You know, it's not there, so there you are with, you know, your five bucks and wondering what you're going to do with it. You don't want to leave empty-handed. You had to ride your bike and risk life and limb to come here, after all. And so, um, you know, you, I've, I've looked around. There's a cool cover. I, that's how I got Judge's Guild supplements. That's the other thing you'd walk away with is Judge's Guild supplements. Um, I think after about 1980, this was different. You actually, I mean, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was out now. People could actually just go and buy the book. But before that, it was really scattershot what you could possibly get. I don't know if this, I mean, I'm surprised by the Netherlands story because it sounds as though that was actually very similar, at least in your region. In my region, it's, it's, I, was, I lived, lived and still live in a, in a, in a big student, student town. Right. That helps. Um, and it helps to have some people. I mean, I, I got my first metal, little metal miniatures um, at a, a flower shop whose owner also played uh, stuff and mostly Napoleonic. Uh, right. Uh, war gaming stuff, but he also had. Uh, well, you know, if, the, the, when Grenadier puts out the little Minotaur, they're pretty hard to resist, right? The Balrog, stuff like that. So, oh yeah, uh, he had he had just a, a normal flower store, and in a little corner there was, if you knew where to find it, you ask for it, 
uh, almost be under the counter, but not quite. I was going to say the head shop analogy is just better and better every time I revisit this era. Um, so, and, and you could, could buy, and, I, and that's the, 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 the place where I first met some people who I started playing with in a group. And some of those people I still play with 40 years later or something, or something like that. I'm not, sure. I'm not that old. Oh, yeah, Herman, that, well, that's a heartwarming story. That's what that is. Yeah. Um, Santiago. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I was I was thinking about it. Uh, well, I grew up in the '90s. You know, I'm uh, 31 now, and I don't think there was there were uh, any role-playing games here in the '80s. I wouldn't know because I, I was born in that decade, but I'm pretty sure there there weren't. Um, it's a thing where the I, I had a, I remember having a, a notion of uh, of what role playing games were that there existed something like it you know uh, and, uh, and and that it was related to to fantasy and I remember I think that the first mention of it I was of it I I read was in a in a video game magazine you know we we had a magazine that's like it was like uh, uh, i think you guys had a nintendo power mm -hmm. stuff like that in the 90s you know ma magazines to to push uh, uh, cartridge games to to little kids uh, mine uh, here in argentina the one we had was called uh, top kids and uh, literally top kids in english and and every month it came with a, a, a Mortal Kombat action figure. You you, you remember Ron the, that's the Quintana one? Good, I had. That's a pretty good. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah it I'm was just... expensive, but mm -hmm. yeah, it was funny because it said uh, it said uh, uh, that it was uh, a gift with the with the magazine, but <laughs> the magazine was. <laughs> So, so much more expensive than all the other similar magazines. Right. You know? So, what kind of gift are we talking? It's free, right? Buy this. It's free. Yeah. 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 Yes, mm -hmm. the doll is free, but the the magazine costs three times. The magazine costs like a doll, you know. Mm. So, I it was actually uh, one uh, article. Uh, you know, in a magazine which is about one thing, like talks a bit about uh, another thing like let's see if this catches on or not they did an article on magic the the gathering oh you know? right the game which, which was just this was uh, i don't know 1995 you know or 94 so it was coming in to all the big turn all the big tournaments were hitting by that point so yeah 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 and we we were in a, in in a moment in in our history and in, in our culture in Argentina, of really getting into uh, American culture uh, more than ever, because after the detection, detectorships of the 70s and the democracy in the 80s, um, we had uh, we had a new president during the 90s who served two terms, and he was really into uh, neoliberal politics you know the imf and stuff so basically what he did to take the country out of a, a really big inflation we had in in 1989 was to uh, borrow lots and lots of money so for about 10 years uh, everyone was amazed at this guy because uh, with we, you could buy one dollar with one peso which is unprecedented in in pretty much I think everywhere, not only Latin America. I'm just I'm just laughing. I mean, talk about another example of empty marketing with implications down the road. But yeah, oh. yeah, exactly. Yes. So it was like people reelected the guy for a second term because they were finally being able to go on vacations to Europe and whatnot. You know, suddenly everyone was rich. Everyone bought a lot of dollars, uh, but by the 2000s, it all came down mm -hmm. a bit like Greece's uh, mm -hmm. crisis. You know how it goes. Didn't so Argentina actually refuse to pay for a little while 
actually refuse to uh, obey the oh, World no, Bank that was for a little bit? Like a decade later. Oh, okay. No, All no, right. no. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, uh, that was another one of these uh, things. Uh, no, no, what happened in 2000, 2001 is suddenly everyone's bank's accounts got frozen and you couldn't take your money out of the bank and everyone who had dollars in their account, they, those got converted to pesos and still you couldn't be withdraw them and suddenly the dollar spiked up. So if you had a hundred dollars, it became a hundred pesos, but suddenly a dollar was worth three pesos. And you had a whole lot less pesos at that point. Yes, I see. Yes, um, and then mm -hmm. they let you withdraw it. So yeah. So, but during the nineties, let's get back to to that. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was really bad for all local uh, markets. Like uh, that's the that's the decade where Argentine right. comics uh, basically died. You know. Ah. But because we were importing so much, suddenly. Uh, that's the thing. When well, you, that's the deal. When you that's, buy the, the that's the IMF deal. That's, that's what it's the deal. for. Right. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you uh, McDonald's start popping up, mm -hmm. and you get to buy a, a lot of uh, things, and all the local industries collapse. Yes. So, what happened was, uh, with that came uh, video games and all of that. It was like a lot of American culture at the same time. Like, I have memories from being young, that some, or, some of them are like, are similar to American 90s kids, like watching Dexter's Lab, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of them are more like 80s kids because suddenly a lot of things came. From like, the 80s, uh, right. Ken, and, right. Yes, like the Ninja Turtles. It was mm -hmm. the 80s and the 90s packed in five mm -hmm. years, you know? Right. And so it, it so happened that um, there were um, role-playing games being uh, printed and translating in uh, Spain. Spain had been, I think, uh, through a. It, it, yeah, Spain I actually was a big was one of the first big booms in Europe. There was there were several yes. all at once. There was there was the Spanish one, the German one, and the Swedish one. Really, um, the thing about Spain, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm no expert on Spain, but they are big on geek culture there. Mm -hmm. And in a way that, to me, it 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 feels different than than the rest of of Europe. Uh, for instance, in comics, uh, we all know that Italians and French aren't into uh, American style comics. We know mm -hmm. that because we want to get into the, our comics. Uh, people get into the the Italian and Spain market and Italian and French markets if they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in Spain, you know, Marvel is really, really big. And yeah, I don't know what happened. But here what happened was that th this always happens with Spain. As soon as they start translating something, they try to push it uh, to here. Mm -hmm. And there's always like this uh, battle between Spanish translator and Mexican translators or Argentine translators, right, right. you know, because there's a lot, there's always been a lot of material uh, illegally imported from Spain because, I mean, you can read it, but it, it is it is in Spanish from Spain. Uh, right. You you shouldn't be doing that. You you should be paying a translator from Latin America. There's always some cultural fight going on be between Mexico, uh, Spain, and Argentina in in Spanish speaking uh, culture around the world. Interesting. Sometimes uh, Brazil gets seen a bit, even right. though they don't right. speak Spanish. The, those are like the four major right. major right. players. And the thing is, it wasn't role-playing uh, per se, you know? It was more about, uh, let's get into Magic the Gathering, let's start playing these video games. It was gaming. I mean, the first time I... Yeah. Uh, what? It was gaming. Gaming well, in the big sense, yeah. yeah. All the different Well, but kinds. we never had war gaming, for instance. That never came here. We went straight from board games to this. Right. Some right. of us did, you know? Most people only know board games. The war gaming doesn't exist. Yeah, I didn't mention war games. I meant I meant gaming as gaming hobby culture. The word gamer. Yeah. Which... Well, but when I think of when I when I, I hear Americans saying gaming hobby culture, instantly I go to to war gaming. Interesting. Okay. That is like uh, like especially like I'm not sure if you would call a, a family play Monopoly gaming. You know. Right. We, we, we don't have a not. Yeah. some board games. Yeah. Like we have, 
from the 70s onward, we have we have a, a very popular Argentine board game that people buy uh, along, uh, I don't know, the other major ones like Monopoly or Clue, you know, mm -hmm. which is called Tag, and it's basically a Risk clone, but it doesn't look like Risk. It looks like the map. I, I can bring it later if you want. The map looks like all 18th century, you know, it's, it's really different, uh, the feel. And anyway, what happened was that, uh, it, this is also interesting, you you couldn't know much, uh, I mean, I, I knew that there were, for instance, uh, role-playing video games, you know, that's the first time I saw the, the, the RPG uh, Acarim, but uh, we couldn't really play um, role-playing video games in the console era because they, they, there weren't Spanish versions. They were only in English or Japanese. Right. So un unless you spoke one of those languages, you didn't get in, into into uh, role-playing video games until the 2000s and the, mm -hmm. the you know, World of Warcraft style So games, what about the role-playing games themselves? When did when did that seem to how did that it seems like they kind of filtered in on the side or something based on what you said? Yes, it was like Magic the Gathering, and well, also there was Tolkien, of course. I mean, uh, I I I received a, a Tolkien book from uh, for a, for my I think it was my eleventh birthday from a, a classmate, my best friend at, at the time. His his big sister knew about Tolkien. She's like five years older than us. And uh, there was a new edition in Spanish, I think. What well, at least here was new that came around in the 90s. And well, of course, um, the big hit, uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure games. You know, yes, the the books, Choose Your Own Adventure books. Those were a big hit in the late 80s. Interesting, because that's exactly 90s. what we were talking about with the fighting fantasy books. Very similar. And yeah. the fighting fantasy books. Ah. That's how the fantasy, fa fighting fantasy books came. Like I went to buy uh, a, 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 a choose your own adventure kind of book, and I got a fighting fantasy book, which was I knew in, about. Was this in English? Did they trans? Were those translated? No, no, no. In, all in Spanish. All, wow. In, all translated in Spain. Huh. Yes. I give me one second. Huh. It's really interesting to. Uh... Yeah, the, the the neoliberal event that made this influx possible, you know, is is a matter of deep historical interest. It's not just, it's not just, it's not as though the market just exists, connecting all the countries, and things just filter through the market. Look at that! Oh yeah, another de la Scorpion, yeah. Uh -huh. See, in Argentina, swan. I would say mm -hmm. yeah. La Cienega del Escorpión, mm -hmm. but the Spanish people will say La Cienega del Escorpión. Oh, but you see, I speak, I might speak or badly speak Mexican Spanish. So hold that up again. Yes. For me, hold Santiago, hold it up for us again. Of course. And I would say La Cienega del Escorpión. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, badly. it's Cienega, but you can see the accent there. Yeah. Oh, Cienega. Cienega. Okay. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay. Cienega del Escorpión. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is also really weird because uh, this was the only. Wait, wait, wait! wait. Move your fingers. Lucha, what? Fantastica? No. Lucha ficción. Lucha ficción. Fighting fiction. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. they translated it, translated it as that. Yes, number eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this it, it's fun because. It's funny because this is the one book that is not is written by the American Steve Jackson. Right. No, that's the English Steve uh, Jackson. Not the, yes, this is the this these books were uh, the editor was the English Steve Jackson, but this one was written by the American Steve Jackson. Oh, really? And they totally got, got them confused. Of course. So, well, we all still get them confused. I mean, that's mm. you know. <laughs> that's... Yes, but the director didn't didn't know this right, so right. You, all you have to read about the author is uh, it's like it's, it's, it's the english one and of course i saw steve jackson and i wanted it because i already had a tune right yes i i, yes. I do have the also this is the photocopy i made when my original copy got uh, to uh, broken i still have the original copy somewhere in a box i don't know so this was um this came out in 96 or 97 wow and 
this was the first and uh, as far as I know only role playing game uh, printed uh, in Argentina that mm -hmm. wasn't a, a Spanish uh, translation and yes when I got that I wanted to to see what role playing role playing games were when I got this I was looking at something like choose your own adventure but I realized this had to do with dice so I thought maybe this is what role playing, playing games is this is the thing sometimes you are like looking for it but you don't really know where it is you only know it's it's uh, good uh, somehow well or this it, is it, yeah it, you you fun. wrote about this before at its play when you talked about the way that you were looking at texts on one hand and looking for a play culture on the other hand at the same time you yes. were trying to find the play culture yes. you're trying to find the text it was chaos because yeah you, you remember i i, I said uh, dexter's lab earlier there was an episode on on dexter's lab uh, which were the the kids playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and I was so psyched about it. I I knew that was it, you know. But uh, it was all it it has always been all these fragments, you know. And and the the real play culture that existed, I think, was uh, mainly in comic shops, you know. Suddenly we had comic shops, which we didn't before. They only sold uh, American right. magazines. Right. Right. Suddenly, no one wanted to read Argentine magazines anymore. Yeah, which, again, you know my opinion. On, you know my opinion on that. The Argentine history of comics is, you know, amazing. So, yes, it uh, is. It totally is. But you know, and and it, it was. It's funny because, uh, as, as an Argentine comics person, it's funny to to see uh, their downfall because they started only selling American comics. Then they had to switch to manga, and they uh, in the middle they became like toy stores for action figures because mm -hmm. you you know there was a global bubble right uh, of of uh, american comics in the 90s you know uh, so that that was global actually the, that crisis that uh, yeah try to collect them oh wait they're worth nothing the the stories are are trash you know yeah. it was like a thing well. but those same uh, those same places organize uh, magic tournaments and also started creating role playing groups and and people started like buying uh, white wolf stuff uh, that was translated on Spain you know and i guess i guess there was also a lot of people playing uh, dungeons and dragons or or the or the middle earth role playing game in our we have i know we have a really big really big uh, Tolkien uh, community that started in the 90s with, with local chapters all over uh, all over Argentina speci especially in in the south you know Bariloche what's missing from what you're describing is the White Wolf games Vampire no, Werewolf no I just said White, White Wolf games oh you did okay no no, no I just so. said that I mean, yeah. people, people were playing them um, actually uh, usually Though those are as you as you know, those are the games that uh, White Wolf games uh, go a little bit beyond the, the the gamer or geek culture. You know, like uh, the friends I have that are studying literature in uh, literature in university. Uh, that's the game they heard. Right. Of well, it was it was pitched to the college and the club crowd. I mean, that was what they were aiming at. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but there wasn't like. I I never really got into uh, that uh, play culture, as you say. Um, and when I got uh, the internet in the in like '97, when I was no '98, when I was uh, 11, and later 12. Um, no, actually a little bit later, like '99, I think it was. Yeah, 13, 14. I I, I already could uh, read English, so I started getting into other sites and. And for a while, even though I, I didn't speak that much English, I the internet got me in touch with the uh, huge sp Spanish uh, gaming culture. You know, there were websites, uh, web rings, uh, uh, mods for White Wolf. You know, I I remember reading over and over uh, uh, a word document that explained how to do um, Highlander in white wolf you know because there was a highlander uh, because, show at the time right. that was, because we need this that was, yes yes 
<laughs> yeah, and that was the, the, the <laughs> first idea of Highlander, you know? That's also this, the funny thing. I went and rented the old Highlander movies with my dad because it sounded so cool to, you know, people chopping other mm. people's heads off and stuff. And it was this thing that, uh, well, you know how it is in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, you also had Fuge, with Fuge uh, got a really good, really fast Spanish uh, translation as well. And it was the thing that you, you would read a lot of docs that really may, maybe it didn't work so much for playing, but it was like, it was almost like a, a proto TV tropes, you know? Right, right. Uh, like people were making these supplements, uh, which were basically, uh, uh, what's that? I remember a phrase you you quoted someone as saying that uh, they were mathematical cliff notes, notes for genres. For genre. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it was that. You know, it like it was like a burst of that. But yeah, I I didn't I didn't get to actually play a role playing game until uh, a comic uh, book convention when I was like eighteen. So right. really, really well, later. A while later, yeah. Than that. Well, let's. Uh, well, yes, let's, but oh, wait, what, what I wanted to say just one little thing. Uh, even though I don't know much about it, I'm sure our our big, uh, as I was saying, our big Tolkien fan community was playing. It, they had to be playing role playing games, and I know they are huge. So right. I bet there there was some work being done there that I didn't know about. Yeah. So what's what is interesting to me is how uh, how easily placed the distribution and the discovery of role-playing games is relative to these very large-scale economic issues. Um, in the States, what I alluded to briefly was the, uh, the domination of the book industry by distribution. So that the distributor became, in many ways, it's a, a sort of tacit version of Reaganomics, trickle-down, right? The, you'll get the books we give you, and um, and you will stock them, and you will be called full service, and people will come in and they will get those books because that's what there is, period. Walden Books pioneered that. They didn't, like many cases, just because they did it first doesn't mean that they could compete against bigger versions of themselves. So let's take a look, though, at these sort of larger things. Herman... The relationship of the Netherlands to uh, NATO and to uh, the American distribution of goods in Europe. Um, if we're talking about the mid to the late 70s, I don't really associate that era with a huge influx of American products into Europe. Um, am I wrong about that or... Uh, we did have in Netherlands uh, quite a sizable uh, bunch of Americans on on NATO basis. Ah, mm -hmm. so there was Susterberg, which had a huge, uh, had a big uh, bunch of Americans there. Um, uh, military, uh, air force, and I think also some. Well, that was a primary means of the distribution of role playing in the United States. Was yeah. through the military bases. So yeah. Well, that was where Europe had quite a few military bases in, in, at the, I think at that time and maybe a bit later. Um, it, it's how we got, for example, the, the, the Society for Creative Mechanism. Right, there. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. They the import, got imported by the Americans and from, it stuck for a bit um, and, and gaming, it's the same guys we did. Of course, we did. no, the, the, at the time the military was the place everybody the, the the nerd military overlap was almost total. Yeah. Um, so uh, and, and the Netherlands has always well, I'm, I'm not sure that always is the right the right word, but we are Anglo centric. Right. We uh, we we don't uh, there's there's hardly any Dutch actual Dutch role playing games. Interesting, even though it had one of these for early ones. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That, 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 that there's maybe three or something wow. like that. And because we all read English, we all speak English, we all so we import the English stuff. 
uh, we don't import the German stuff because we don't like German. And right. We can't read, we can't read French. I mean, in <laughs> general. <laughs> no, that's actually, okay, so that gives a certain amount of perspective. Um, but it's not quite the same as the dedicated uh, distributional takeover of the Netherlands the way it happened in Argentina a little bit later. So it's a different phenomenon. Yeah, but didn't yeah. the UK uh, distribute a lot of their stuff? I mean, their their gaming came just what a couple years after. Um, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of UK stuff or UK versions of uh, American. I mean, Games Workshop after they uh, they stopped being just that small little core. Right when they started making uh, things, uh, make was their first. Someone should correct me on this. Their very first game, was it Dark Conspiracy? Or was there one before that? Maybe a militaristic one? I don't know if they, they did Judge Dredd, I think. Uh, which is based on the book, on the, on the copy. Right, right. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think my request two, and at least my request three books are UK books. Uh -huh. Our Games Workshop produced uh, versions of uh, American huh. or originals. Um, and they distributed, there was there was a sizable PSR in, in the UK as well. They had their own uh, magazine, Imagine, which was, was the PSR version, UK version of the Dragon. One. Right, yeah, I, I know about Imagine, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So I I think I mean I would like to, I wish there were more people here so we would get a different you know a different look at the different decades and regions. I mean I I personally need to hunt down living in Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to hunt down a lot more about how the uh, the the home culture of Swedish games began because it was it it was and is remains pretty strong. Um, and is one of the few places where the games originally published in Swedish gain a very sizable American and British mm -hmm. fan base once they get translated. That it's one of the few places where the flow is very definitely in the opposite direction. Um, and that also interests me too, considering Sweden's general economic independence from the... Uh, from the, the the other European countries, which prior to the 1990s, prior to the EU, was all based on uh, the Deutschmark, was sort of the gold bar, you know, of Europe, and um, yeah. and Sweden sort of kept itself one step away from being ruled by the Deutschmark. Um, the right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and so I, all, I don't know if that's too simplistic to say that because there was a certain amount of economic independence that the, the, uh, such a strange little indicator as, you know, this grassroots hobby that nobody ever, I mean, no venture, no big venture capitalist ever jumped in. And when they did, even in the States, they just lost all their money. So, you know, that's what happened to TSR and uh, more than once and so it uh it's really weird to to think about this and in some ways because it's such a grassroots thing it's almost a better indicator of these very unique economic moments than a, a standard product would be yeah. which is buffered by its distribution and buffered by the investments in it and buffered by its shares you know it's it's its shareholders and you know, it's value in that weird financial world. Role playing has no value in that world whatsoever, mm -hmm. right? Nobody, nobody buys stock in role playing games. Not that, not the kinds of games we're talking about. Yep. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, other thoughts on this? I'm curious about this sort of larger economic picture that role playing games weirdly fit well, into. Well, it seems to me lately with uh, the stuff we've been talking about and stuff you have written about it seems to me like I'm not sure if, if they're I, I've become really s skeptic of the notion of uh, profitable role-playing games you know 
I've always been uh, I've always been a bad voice in the wilderness about that. You know, quit quit chasing the dragon, quit chasing the you know, the, the Amy of uh you know the profitable the role playing game. Cha- well it's um, oh, it's the Yes but Yeah. Yeah, and, and also comics. I mean, like you, uh, with uh, your your blog, you you have shown like, uh, you know, stuff like Marvel and DC making money only of of their derivatives like radio and mm-hmm. movies, and toys and whatnot, and and these things that, I mean, I, I think it's a bit similar both in uh, role playing games and in and in. In comics and maybe a lot of other 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 things that in the 90s it, it all seems so prosperous and then boom mm-hmm. you know much like the Argentine peso actually mm-hmm. and <laughs> and you know I was thinking about that like you 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 certainly couldn't couldn't say the same about the derivatives like the the video game ones you know like right. World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy and, and mm-hmm. wherever you know and it, it I don't know it makes me wonder uh, because well at least from the from a creator's point of view it it sounds a bit like a, a relief if if there is something in it in a in a form that helps to to stay focused on the on the little projects you know whether it's role playing games or or comics well I yes on know. the other hand it's I littered mean, it's littered, so littered with the 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 mental and physical wreckage of people who invest heavily in it from a creative standpoint so well uh, i you know there's with with role playing like um in terms of profitability and stuff i think one of the main things that always kind of keeps it at, at a certain level is the fact that any role-playing game is going to be dependent completely on the quality of the game master. Um, but we, I we can expand that to the participants in general just to be a little more true. democratic. This, this is okay. true, too. This yeah. is true. Um, but I think there's going to be an enormous renaissance. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a nice little golden age right now, sort of, of role-playing, but the true explosion is going to come with VR. When VR finally hits in five or ten years, that's when I think we're going to see it. Do you think so? Because with VR, isn't that just going to be... Is it, hasn't World of Warcraft already paved that way with its rendering? No, n- no. N- not even. Because I'm talking about role-playing. I'm talking about, you know, uh, buying uh, assets like, oh, you know, okay, we're going to play Champions Online and, and we're going to buy this Cityscape expansion. And, uh. and it comes with all the buildings and all the stuff and all the power effects, you know. And then, you know, because it's hard to get together with a bunch of people at somebody's house every, you know, once a week or, or once every other week. But logging in and, and doing something like this for a, a few hours and you're in the virtual world with the game master and the whole thing, I, I do you think that, uh, do you think that the the medium will permit the same kind of, uh, you know, I go here, I do this freedom that the spoken word has, because well, that's course, really. I mean, it yeah. does now. The only difference is instead of using miniatures or instead of using cardboard standees, we're in a virtual space, and the game master is, you know, it it could still be turn based. There's nothing. It's just going to be in the VR. I mean, right now, I, I've played in some amazing D&D games that were in uh, in Fantasy Grounds, right? But the GM, he had some uh, Photoshop skills, and so he was able to really kind of make the make the things and, you know, and uh, use the tools of Fantasy Grounds because it's still kind of, you know, it takes some time. You get you yeah. got to put your two or three hours, four hours of prep time before you get to the table to make it a true kind of quote unquote video game experience. But you know, yeah. once once VR hits and these kind of tools become uh, easy to use and all this stuff, I I think that you know that's really going to hit because it's still World of Warcraft is not role playing. World of Warcraft is uh, you know. No, it's you're, pre-programmed. You're, that's for sure. That's it's the, all pre-programmed. Right. right, I get that. the The thing I'm uh, that's what I'm talking about. What can and cannot be preserved through the addition of more visual experience. Um, and I'm not arguing with you. I'm raising this as a 
sure. as a question that will that history will answer. That, that well, I mean, it's but, it's it's the same thing as having miniatures, right? Except it's it's virtual. Well, the question though is the 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 miniatures have been supplementary rather than primary. So the the interesting question is, okay. My argument, or at least my perception of role playing to date, is that its medium is the medium of listening. Yes, theater so, of the mind. Right. When well, and and more of communication. I mean, so it's not just that we're thinking and imagining internally; it's that we are actually speaking to one another and taking what one another says and then returning words to be heard. And so, I'm a very interested in that communicative bridge as the medium uh, rather than the internal visualization and so the with that in mind and, and I, this is germane to the uh, the Italian convention that I spoke at um, last year early last year March 2017 um, and I, I was um, speaking in tandem with a long time computer game designer who has always wrestled with can you actually make original fiction in this medium and so he's always wrestled with this and, <laughs> yeah, and fought the fought the algorithms you know and came to the conclusion that the algorithms that really matter are the ones that we use with each other rather than the ones that are part of the medium of experience so the question of medium as what you're watching it on where which is not quite the same as the medium of performance the medium of doing for example we can talk about the medium of music being sound but you can listen to it on all these different devices as well as sit there and have it be live so the medium of transmission isn't what i'm talking about the medium of doing is what i'm talking about now when you talk about vr my question is are we just talking about medium of transmission if so cool i mean it's a cool medium of transmission but the question is whether the medium of doing is going to be preserved well um, it's it's a medium of transmission and it's also uh, it also makes it easier for people to get together true but you know like like let's say you're running a champions game and and we're, and you're exploring some subplots with uh, NPCs and things like that. Well, that doesn't th that all happens through communication. But as soon as a bad guy comes out and it goes into combat turns, right? Even even if you're just doing pure theater of the mind, you're not going to just go, okay, well you move over here and you know, I mean, having that combat being visual, I think is well, it's I completely agree. In, in my, my design work right now, that's actually a, a consideration. Um, it's what we talked about in the last Monday Lab, um, or one of the last Monday Labs recently, where we talked a lot about, even though a lot of role players, some versions of role playing, like to disrespect the battle maps and the miniatures and counting the hexes and stuff like that, um, there is a reason why positioning and capability and movement matter and so yes. um and i talked a lot about whether you're doing it as a causal effect for what you can do or whether you're filling in the gap based on what you say you accomplish well now how did you manage to accomplish that and you still have to account for it or did the fiction isn't any fun and so it's uh it's a big piece of what's going on. If VR can help with that, well, that's that's part of it. I mean, that's what Fantasy Grounds does. Right. It's you know, you move. Okay, well, here's your, you know, you could only move this far. Okay, and and then okay, you're going to use your attack. Okay, well, all the math is all done for you. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting but question. You, I mean, there, was a, there was a video game a few years ago. I don't know if if it ever got fully developed. It was an indie game by a guy who who got famous doing like 
uh, it's called uh, video game uh, poems or, or stuff like that. I, I heard about it at the now defunct Red, Cox, Red Costikians uh, play this thing site. And it was a game that on the trailer it looked like a um, um, Super Nintendo RPG where you, you, you look little uh, and you, you were you move around talking to, to people in like Pokemon style fashion and then at the end it showed you that actually all the interactions weren't with a computer but there was a guy on the other side that could uh, play all the various characters and move them in real time so you could make like you could make like your own uh, RPG story you know no that's a big deal because but... again that's what the fellow I was talking about Chris Crawford was fighting he said you can't have an automation of story response you right. can well, if the... you, you have to have you know in a way people made fun of Star Trek doors with the guys on the other side of the doors you know making them go whoosh yeah. whoosh and people made fun of that but in some ways that's the only way to do what we're talking about yes well all right. these people uh, that there's a line there's a big influence I mean Chris Crawford Greg Kostick right. and, and this guy which I, I will go with his name they are also on the they are all on the Chris Crawford the sphere right. of influence right. yes the idea was that you, you could play around with these elements as if they were well miniatures uh, precisely like mm. you you made it look like a, a Super Nintendo video game but it right. was actually you moving things around it, it was fun to watch I don't know if, if the guy ever finished it I mean, mm. I mean it was uh, like it was like for purchase like a demo or something I don't know what happened what, with, with what that. interests me and another analogy that I've probably beaten into the ground over the years is the difference between it, it, it's now how I introduced role playing to to other people who are interested. And they say, "What is this? You know, is it?" And of course, they always ask the same things. They say, "Is it a board game? Is it a computer game?" And you have to say, "No." Um, <laughs> and you have to sort of change the focus of the question because, say, it doesn't matter if it has a board. It doesn't matter if you use a computer. What matters is that these are more like musical instruments. I can hand you the musical That's instrument. Very, very yeah, and it will have properties. This instrument is not the same as that other instrument. So role-playing games are different from one another in their specific properties. But the fact is, is that it's not going to do anything. And you can't play the, musician, the musical instrument the way that you play the board game by following the instructions, you know, through it. And that's not really fair to board games because people don't play them mechanically, they play them strategically. But the but the idea being that that this thing is inert unless you are making certain choices and what you do with it this time is unique in in time, you know, it's unique. And so that helps people understand it a little bit better. That's the property that I'm interested in being preserved in different transmission media. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, yeah, that's you know, what I'm aiming if, at. If, if you take that out, then it's no longer. It's just not. Yeah, it isn't the thing. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the word yeah, role playing has been appropriated. About... The word role playing has been appropriated many times for different things. I mean, right, how many times if, I mean, I think we sort of forget all the times we say role-playing game and the person kind of grins wicked, wickedly and says, can I be the maid? You know, and you say, no, <laughs> all right, all right, that's not what I mean, you know. But that's what they think you mean. Or at least, you know, that's they, they're more familiar with that meaning than they are of any other kind. So whatever it is, even the word role-playing is a really shitty name for it because it, that word is used for yeah. so many different things. I mean, so whatever the damn thing is, <laughs> no. um, is that preservable through, I mean, my, my worry is that computers and digital media are so enthralling on their own that it's way too easy for the renditions to become more important than the activity. And so, yeah, but, but that's why you buy it. No, I know. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, that's the again. This isn't a. I'm not. I don't want to be in the position of you know, and that's going to ruin it. You know, son of a bitch. You know, that's. Right, right. I don't want to be. I'm not taking yeah. that position so much as raising this as I think the primary question. Yeah. So Santiago, well, I'm but sorry. It's a bit I, like I remember. Um, I remember my my comics teacher who's about your age, and he and other other people were arguing about uh, Guitar Hero, you know, and whether right. that... Right, well, it's going like, to ruin it, yeah. yeah. Oh, back in the 90s, we bought, we bought actual... He, in the 90s, he was in a metal band, so... In the 90s, we bought actual... actual... Uh, actual uh, guitars and uh, learned to play them and whatever. It's, it's that... It's, I, I, I think it's really hard sometimes to... to talk about uh, things that are interesting to do uh, that you sh that you shouldn't be scared of doing, but that they are also not can experiences, which is the the thing you talk right. about with right. musical right. instruments. Yeah. That's yeah. the first thing that I mean. I, I love that analogy, but the the and we we have talked about talked about this before. Uh, the first thing it comes to mind when someone tells me it's like a musical instrument is then. Well, then I won't be able to play it, you know, and I need to study real hard to do this. This is not natural. We are always, it's a, it's a cultural thing, a cultural phenomenon way bigger than all of this, but, but a, a phenomenon we are really familiar with that. Uh, and I think that's also why it's hard to market sometimes. Well, I agree. I mean, obviously, it's it's not it's you know, not a, an entertainment, told, it's not an entertainment yeah. media or and then I fight like, the I fight the Italians on this. The company I work with in Italy really wants that ease of play to be a primary thing, yeah. and to be told no, it's more like a musical instrument. There is a learning curve. There just is. And guess what? You might be bad at it. Yeah, but that, you, that's you not might suck at, at all. You know, I it's not a selling point. In, yeah, it's definitely the, not a selling point. In, let, let's say Western culture. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm. The more time passes, I'm. I'm more convinced that Latin America is not part of, of Western culture. It's, it's something else. But let's let's, for the sake of the argument, say in Western culture, uh, we are always told that you can either buy something and show it, or like uh, pay someone to teach you to do something that's hard, and then and show it and. And, and brag about it, you know, and resent people who are better uh, than you at that. It's not really... And and the other stuff is considered lame, you know. If everyone can do it, and it, if it takes time, it's like... I, I have to admit, I have a, I'm, I'm kind of, a, of schizophrenic about this. On the one hand, I'm famous for saying it's like musical instruments, and the extent to which that's true, I think, is is fair. On the other hand... I'm the one who's always saying that there's nothing mystical about making a story. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be the author, you know, or the great director. You don't have to be this really scary person who can make stories and the rest of us can't. So in some ways, here I am talking about it as a very undemocratic phenomenon, or at least not mass marketable phenomenon in the same way that so much entertainment media is mass market. Well, and yet on the other, other hand, is on the other hand, I'm being like the ultimate, the ultimate democ democratic guy. You know, anybody can do it. So, yeah. You know, my, my main thing that gets me excited about the emerging technologies is, is that it makes it easier for people to get together and play. Not so much that it's going to change the actual play experience, just that, boy, you know, now, because I'm in, in Southern California, eh, there's not a huge, especially here in San Diego, there's it, there's not a huge, uh, you know, population of people that are playing, you know, old school role playing games. However, if I could get on the internet and stream and, and have this thing, and all of a sudden, boom, man, I... You know, boy, I could be in a game every night of the week if I really wanted to. Well, you know? arguably, <laughs> arguably, we can do that to some extent now that we have media like this at Discord, which five, even five years ago, I was skeptical. I said, online play of this kind, it's like, you know, having sex through a paper bag. 
you know, it's it. You can do right. it, but yeah. <laughs> really, you know, why would you? And uh, but I've changed my mind. I've actually had a really, really good time playing in exactly the medium we're using right now, and um, and found it remarkably effective. There are some differences. There's some weirdness to it, but not yeah. The, it not makes too bad. potluck a little harder, right? But it's but it's possible, and so it. Uh, and, and not just in that limping along way either. The, the human contact, the facial expressions, the warmth of the interaction is surprisingly still present. And that's what I was afraid would be lost. So I, I'm really excited. That's the thing. To me, the, the big change, it, it comes not... not it, it's not really that you can do it with people all over the world suddenly. That That is a big thing, of course, but... The fact that you can record it, I think that's where the the explosion is coming that's in, nice and too. also the yeah. dangers. You know, like uh, I remember uh, Ron complaining about uh, the people who are doing it as as a form of of a spectacle. You know, it's a bit like improv comedy, right? And like, how much is it improvised? How, do you really think anyone can do it or not? Do you want to do it? I mean, what happens? I mean. It's really good that people can see there are people role playing and, and people can show it and people can be proud of doing role playing games and 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 suddenly uh, more people want to get into that because they are seeing people having fun. Right. But also like it ha it's happened over the past 15 years with all of the YouTube streaming culture. Suddenly it becomes well more of a slick and staged and performance. Uh, it, yeah. Yes. Well, you see, that's it's one of the, the reasons. It's not the same to be yeah. a, a YouTuber now that it was right. ten years ago. Well, I I'm, mean, I'm trying to be a little bit everyone, old. Everyone yeah. wants you to be better, you know, but makeup and whatever. I'm and trying to be a little. Yeah. Close. yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to have at its place be a little more uh, streetwise, a little more rough and ready, a little more obviously just people. Um, I'm kind of aiming for that human touch. Here in Sweden, when I talk about what I'm doing, I get some really interesting reactions sometimes. And it really struck me kind of hard when I talked about what I was doing and a person said, we need this here. And I said, that's funny. What do you mean? You know, we don't really talk about this as a, as a product of need. This is a product of quirky, you know, uh, quirky misfits. You know, it's not really a. I'm interested in what you mean that there's actually a, a, an unknown or unacknowledged need for this. What do you mean? And they specifically pointed to the fact that it was a human only activity. Now, granted, I'm not talking about the, the medium of transmission, that can be very technological. But the, the notion that this was a medium or an activity which was absolutely predicated on people listening to one another. And there was no primary medium <clears throat> that that was secondary to. You can say other games are social because you can talk about them and enjoy each other while you play them. But the playing of the game in and of itself is, well, there's some debate about it. I can debate that. But the, the somewhat mechanistic nature of most strategy games um they they the the person listening to me was very excited about the idea that this activity was so based on human communication that yes. you had to be involved with other people in order to do it and um you know there is also the old joke that you know Role-playing as an activity is landed in precisely the wrong culture to be cultivated in because it was all these awkward people, you know. And so I don't know if that's, <laughs> yeah, that's I, so funny. Yeah, I don't know if that's inevitable, you know. I mean, I don't know if it's inevitable that because I mean, there, there's somebody's going to have a really good time writing a dissertation about that one day. Um, yeah, nerds in the military, the, yeah. the first people to think about when you think about uh, yeah. human empathy. Yeah, precisely, and, precisely, yeah. And, and, the an epic, epic fantasy, you know, the massive work of imagination that's necessary to do that. Um, yeah. But then again, here I am dissing my own subculture when I talk like this. So, um, so the, 
the the idea basically is this for this um, this Monday lab. We've gotten a little bit away from it, but maybe not so much, because all media of interaction are technologies, all of them. Technology doesn't just filter around. Technology is distributed. Technology is owns. Technology arrives in weird waves subject to things like international monetary fund policy that year or you know the 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 uh the the weird membranes that you find between uh, uh i would say east and west berlin but that's just a microcosm but the the membranes that you find by which american pop culture was distributed throughout eastern europe in often surprising forms that you know weren't really known or acknowledged in their points of origin um or other interesting membranes like the boom of role-playing design in japan so we we japan's interesting because in many ways it's more subjected to a barrage of american culture than almost anywhere else on earth but on the other hand fights back in that sense with its own creative culture you know surprisingly successfully um and yes, so the, they and Japan is so yeah it's kind of weird that way I, so I'm always uh, as someone from outside the united <laughs> states you know i'm always surprised like we would be too proud to do something like super mario you know i mean to make up a character who's not from our country and sell it to other countries. Like, he's Italian, lives right. in Brooklyn, and was invented by Japanese. We couldn't do that. We would do either a 100% a, a American-like or European-like product, or a, a gaucho, I don't know. Right, something right, really, right, something really Argentine, uh, yeah. Local, yes, really mm -hmm. Argentine, you mm -hmm. know. They have a, a detachment that uh, it's admirable, but also creeps us uh, out a bit because, like, well, the, why do they make right. the eyes round on these anime characters? You know, they are Japanese. That that they scare us. You know, a bit. But well, they, I think they are the, fighting the fight. Right. You know, they are fighting the fight against America. So that's that's good. Somewhat. It's a very tricky question. There's there are economic interactions there that are not simple, and um, the so it's it's a really good question. So I think that these economic contests genuinely set what technologies are available and how they can be used um it's not a random pattern these are very causal um they may be very contingent completely subject to the moment completely subject to the region completely subject to the immediate history but they're caused and so it makes me wonder if we're talking about a renaissance of role-playing and by which I'm going to define this by which the medium becomes a habitual form of interaction and entertainment in a given place um, is it going to be due to the availability of a specific technology like you're talking about with VR I mean, sort of, and it, what by, I mean, the advent, the advent of a new technology, and 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 uh, an opening device, something that actually opens it to more broad use. Is it going to be something like that, or is it going to be people who genuinely don't care about geek or hobby culture at all, and as far as they're concerned, have invented something new? Well, you know, no. I, I think that, uh, you know, I think that it'll never go away. Right. Because it, it's it's something that, um, you know, it, it, you, it's you can't a, replicate. It, right. However, it, right. you know, it, it also kind of brings up, like, our generation, you know, we're not getting any younger. Right. And so it's all about passing down, like, kind of what you're doing with the champions now, making it, training a new 
uh, generation of game masters, really. I'm hoping to, players. yeah. Or at least people who who promulgate a particular uh, shared creative power at the table, right? Yes, yes. And that's, and that's usually typically the person who organizes play for everybody in that social group, so I get what you mean. But... Uh, but the hope, I mean, yes, I mean, I, I want the fundamentals of the activity to be preserved and not just to be a one-off. Maybe Dungeons and Dragons will just disappear. It almost has more than once. Um, but who cares, really? But I'm is not... there a geek culture, after all, to, to because you said people who are start doing it who don't know anything about geek culture and, and they think they invented it themselves. But I think geek culture has basically dissolved into pop culture well yes I mean, yes pop pop com pop games, commerce uh, not even pop commerce pop commerce right every yes of course yeah. i mean after Bill gates and mark zuckerberg and everyone having a phone right uh, a, a computer in their pocket in, in their pocket and uh, the marvel movies you know who who was who would have thought superhero movies would be uh, this uh, phenomenon and I don't know uh, the pop stars like um, I don't remember any pop stars right now I'm, I'm, I'm tired of speaking English so much but uh, yeah, Miley sorry. Cyrus pop stars right. like Miley Cyrus say, saying yes I was bullied when I was a teenage right. a teenager you know like uh, it like it's cool now to be to be nerd and it probably will be for Americans right. let's, for the next yeah, 10 let's, or 20 years a big so topic I'm not sure there is yeah. Yes, I'm not sure there will be something outside to say. Well, we are outside the geek culture and we are doing it. You know. Well, perhaps because that's a good question too. Anyways, uh, that's about what I have for tonight. In some ways, this question of the economic and historical ways that a region encountered role playing, I'd like to see more discussion at it when I post this and have right other. On. This this might be one of those things where the real power comes in the comments. You know, where someone goes crazy and, like, gives us a huge cultural essay that none of us dreamed. I mean, your, your presentation of Argentina was just remarkable. I mean, look at all, mm -hmm. look at all the real history that's embedded in, right? So, um, yes. but, uh, but anyway, good night. Thank you so much for joining me for a, yep. a fun little Monday Lab. Um, the next thank one, you, I think, thank you. yeah, the next one, I think I'm going to have more like a creative project, you know, a thing we do, make people roll dice or something, you know. For the next one, um, but uh, but it was great. Welcome to our first timer. Appreciate that. Thanks. And I, uh, I ordered a webcam. Oh no! This was going you were, on, you so. were punching your buttons on the webcam. <laughs> so, so next time you'll be able to see my beautiful face. Excellent. Well, great. Take care, everybody. Good night. Okay. Good night. Yeah.